You are able to see the slides, right? So last week, you know, we have started our uh, planetary seismology. Right? So this, uh, you know, so of course, the planetary geology was useful to find out, you know, uh, that is the surface ages and other things also. But if you want to know, sir, what is inside a planet, you know, so this uh, seismology becomes very important and we have to instrument that place. And if there are any, you know, quakes or impacts or whatever, so by looking at analyzing those type of data sets, sir, we can easily find out, you know, what is inside the planet, like whether it has a liquid core or what is the material properties, you know, P wave velocity, shear waves, you know. So all those details can be estimated also. Okay. So the idea what we said was uh, you know, this concept we said in the last class. Okay. So whenever there is a large magnitude earthquake, so nine magnitude or whatever, the whole planet uh, you know, the vibrates. So last class I told you this SK, PKP, PK, JKP. So all these type of phases we can observe from the data. And then if the wave has passed through the solid inner core or whatever, so using that information, we can uh, go back and then construct, you know, the, uh, you know, the uh, metal property or what is, uh, you know, the, the characteristics of that particular uh, region. So, so this is a basic philosophy. Now, apart from uh, large magnitude earthquakes, so now recently, you know, very excellent instruments have been developed there. Even for 6.5 magnitude also, or on Earth, basically, you know, they can record all these small, small vibrations which happens in our in the planet itself. Okay. So this is a philosophy. Okay. So I showed you in the last class also. So we have seen uh, you know what happens when uh, you know earthquake occurs, and I have also shown you like in moon say. So people have recorded and then using these data sets, you know, so they have identified the velocity model, you know, what is inside the moon and other things also we have said. And finally, we said for moons up to 1300 kilometer only, you know, the information is very well known to us, okay? But from 1300 to 1737, say, so what type of core it is, uh, you know, we don't have any idea because, you know, there has been no waves, you know, has been recorded, which has passed through all through the uh, core itself. So once you get that information, so then you can do these type of inversions and come up with this uh, metal properties also, okay? Now for uh, Mars, as already I told, we don't have any you know, information, but only InSight mission went, you know, I think last two years back. So from that, now the data has come up. So now people are using the data, say, and then, you know, trying to find out, you know, the metal properties and other things inside the um, Mars also, okay? So the basic, the most important thing as already I told you. So, you know, the of course, Earth, we have a huge network, so you can do whatever you like, but when you want to do planetary seismology, so maybe, you know, with one instrument only, you know, you may have to do all the work. So like Mars, you know, we have data from only one place. Now, even Chandra and Pariser, one seismograph only is going, you know, so with that only we may have to do this one. And of course, the future means without an instrument also, can you get some information about the internal structure of the planet? Then it is a work. Now coming to this one, so now how do we find out the internal structure of a planet? Sir? I just told you in brief, but today we will discuss a little bit, uh, you know, some more mathematical details, how to get this uh, information also. So as already I told you in, in the previous classes also, so you are having instruments, a broadband instrument, you know, the weak motions, which can record, uh, I have told you, right, I think a huge, uh, uh, spectrum is there okay so these instruments are very you know the weak motion long periods they can calculate so as last time itself we have got like vertical and longitudinal components say. they will have uh, you know the rally waves and then the transverse components of so the low waves will be the shear and this one okay so this we have discussed previously also then apart from that you know as already you know last class also i told you when there is any earthquake say what happens is these waves will travel several times actually, okay? Not once, you know, they may have traveled two times or three times also. Of course, their amplitude will keep on decaying itself, but they travel multiple times. And we also call this as orbit waves, multi-orbit uh, waves itself, you know? So using this information say, so how do we find out the internal structure of a planet is a question, okay? So this is also one typical, uh, you know, the earthquake, okay? That is, I think, uh, you know, it has been recorded at Berkeley, you know, the laboratory. I think this is uh, some earthquake in Columbia earthquake. Bar. This is earthquake occurred in China, Burma region, okay? And its magnitude was 6.8, but the instruments are now sophisticated, you know? So, so 6.8 also, you can see the whole uh, earth site has vibrated several times, okay? So R1 means the sharpest one. 
then R2 means, you know, the longest wave, then R3, R4, so they are all multiple, uh, you know, waves. I have told you the terminology also. Odd number stands for, you know, like R1 set. Now the same R1 set goes this way and then once again come back, that will be R3, R5, R7, the odd numbers are this one and R2 are the waves which are coming from other side of the one. Then R4 means is also like this, you know, several uh, times also we have said in the uh, previous class also. So this information, say, like, you know, because the waves are traveling multiple times, so uh, what happens is, you know, they, these waves may pass through the inner core and inner material also. So using this information, so like a non-destructive testing, you know, we will we should be able to identify what is inside the planet. Actually. So this is a tradition, okay? Now, how do we do this one is, so like if you look at a time history, so say, this is an Alaskan earthquake, okay? Like in, uh, which occurred 1987 and it has been recorded. You can easily identify R1, R2, R3, R4, you know, all types of uh, waves itself, okay? Now you can also find out the arrival time. So what time it has arrived, like this is six hours basically. So R1 occurred, you know, maybe less than one hour. Then R2, so it occurred, you know, after one more hour, you know, the waves have traveled. I showed you the animations also, you know, in the last uh, class itself, okay? Now what generally one does is, uh, you know, when you see this time history, say, so this is how it looks like, okay? The graph looks something like this, okay? So from this graph, so you can easily identify what time actual these waves are uh, coming also. Now, another way of looking at this information is say, you take the Fourier transform, so the frequency content basically. So the frequency content, if you try to plot it, that means, you know, so you are doing a Fourier transform, so time versus amplitude, you convert into same amplitude versus frequency itself, you will see, you know, these type of several uh, uh, peaks will be there basically. So all these peaks, say, you can see one peak is at, you know, some 1.5 or, you know, 1.6 millihertz, then two, and of course, the, the seismogram duration is 60 hours, actually. It's a huge, you know, the whole earth vibrated for 60 hours, actually, during this earthquake, say. So you will see multiple, multiple uh, peaks itself. So question is, what are these peaks, you know? So these peaks, say, basically, the whole wave, the whole earth is vibrating. So the whole planet itself is vibrating. So what happens is, you know, you can easily identify, you know, the R, what are these peaks that correspond for these multiple peaks, so what do they indicate? So some of you would have done the structural dynamics course also. Can you identify what are these peaks basically? Yeah. Or what happens, you know, when an earthquake occurs, say, earthquake will occur only for a short period of time only, you know. Just for 10 seconds, you know, I told you, right, earthquake, the rupture speed is a 2 to 3 kilometer per second. So, it is a 6 magnitude earthquake, say, in hardly 10 seconds, you know, everything will be over, basically, okay? So, in 10 seconds, if everything is over, say, so now, but you are recording a, uh, this, uh, you know, the whole earth is vibrating for 60 hours, basically, okay? So, what does these things mean, sir? You know? So, what is these R1, R2, R3, R4, so they correspond to what, you know, when you go after a long times so after two hours or three hours or so. so these waves what happens what do you call these things in the dynamics also you know now you have done right what do you call this one no. so if you have done the structural dynamics you say okay so now source effect is only for the source is there only for 10 seconds only, okay so in the 10 seconds you know the energy has gone and then you know it starts vibrating and the source has died down you know that the source there is no moments are happening but still the earth is vibrating itself. So what do you call this type of thing? Without any force also, you know, things are vibrating. What do you call this one? What do you call the vibration? Yeah? Residual. Residual. No, in uh, dynamics, we have one specific word. Utkar, she have done course, uh, dynamics. No, sir. Oh, you have not done. Okay. So, what do you call this as a free vibration? You follow, right? So, free vibration means you take a pendulum, sir, okay? And you do, you are not giving any force, just you are giving initial displacement and you are releasing, okay? So, then that is what we call as a free vibration. Now, in earthquake, basically, you are having a force, okay, initially, but the force is only for 10 to 10 seconds only it is acting. After that, you know, the force has gone, but still the whole earth is vibrating, you know. So this is what, you know, like free oscillations of earth also we can call. But for that, you know, you have to record the seismogram for 60 hours or, you know, huge duration. So you will see these multiple peaks basically, okay. 
so all these peaks is here what it tells you is you know they will tell about you see the natural frequencies you know of our earth itself because it's a free vibration sir no force is there so the earth will vibrate at its own natural frequency so you can see if you take a typical uh, you know the this velocity is uh, data and then you take a fourier transform you will see multiple peaks so what people have tried to do is you know they try to identify they try to uh, identify the peaks uh, the physics basically of these peaks itself and identifying the peaks you know you can find out the natural frequencies of our earth and once you know the natural frequencies sir you can easily find out stiffness mass and all other metal properties and you can calculate the internal structure of our earth itself okay so this is a concept so this also you know like you see this is also bolivia earthquake you know okay some 35 hours you know the seismogram has been uh, recorded basically and then you take the fourier transform sir so you will get in the frequencies in millihertz basically so these are several peaks you can identify of course we will come to that one why 1s1 and you have seen in that uh, jessica that you know that he, uh, professor jessica's lecture on normal modes also so each of these peaks is they correspond to one typical uh, you know the mode basically of our planet earth so this is how you know you can identify the peaks once you know the peaks you can go back and calculate the you know the natural frequencies very well known and then you can calculate the metal properties and other uh, things also okay so this is a concept so this is what we call as you know the normal mode uh, you know the seismology so the philosophy is so whenever there is any quake or impact or whatever say and if the instrument is very sophisticated say it will be able to record you know the multiple waves that's a multiple orbit waves itself and suppose if there is any impact say impact will be there only for few seconds only but if the waves are vibrating several times so it becomes like in you know, a free vibration kind of a thing and once from the free vibration say you can easily find out uh, you know the natural frequency and of course its corresponding stiffness or the metal properties and other uh, details also so that is a philosophy so finally so if you want to find out internal structure of any planet say it boils down to find estimating the natural frequencies you know of a planet if you know the natural frequencies natural frequency anyway is related to stiffness you know and anyway stiffness is related to ei you know all other things so you can get all the information itself so this is a trick how do we get the natural frequency of a planet okay so of course several natural frequencies will be there but you should be able to get all these uh, natural frequencies and the mode shapes for a planet itself so this is a philosophy okay so this is anyway uh, dynamics of course uh, some of you have not done so generally in dynamics also so if you are having a cantilever beam basically okay and if you want to find out the response for a cantilever beam say to some uh, concentrated load or whatever say okay or step function or whatever so what is the procedure you adopt you know uh, abhilash i think you have done the dynamics course right how do you find out the response of a cantilever beam or response of a multi degree of freedom system to some forces so what is the philosophy we do in uh, our dynamics So what is the method? Multiple single degree. Ah, excellent. Okay. So the main thing is it is a basically the universal principle in entire uh, mathematics. Okay. So what mathematics is whenever you see any complicated problems, you split it into small, 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 small pieces. Okay. So the entire structural dynamics is there. So you will be taught single degree of freedom system only. But when it comes to multi degree or continuous systems, so what you will be taught is how to break a multi degree of freedom system or a continuous system into several single degree of freedom systems. Okay. So if you know how to analyze a single degree of freedom system, so that's it. You know you can solve any problem. But the only thing you should know is how to break a system into several single degree of freedom systems. So that is where your eigen value, eigen vector analysis comes into picture itself. So the for cantilever beam, sir, what one does is you know you find out all the mode shapes. So if it's a continuous system, sir, you will be having uh, you know infinite uh, mode shapes will be there. If it is a multi degree, sir, like ten degree of freedom system means you can break into ten single degree of freedom system. So you will be having only ten. Okay. So this is how the philosophy we do. Like this, you know, the first mode shape of a cantilever, second mode shape, third mode shape, fourth, fifth, sixth, you know, this type of mode shapes you break it down. you know its natural frequencies and the final solution so we write as a summation of all these uh, numbers itself okay so i'm just showing this violin string that is a longitudinal vibration say so this is the equation of motion so c is the velocity you know root of mu by rho or root of e by rho for this uh, you know the string and this is a equal the one dimensional wave equation say okay and this is a boundary condition x is equal to 0 displacement is 0 
it is something like you know simply supported kind of thing so now what one does to solve this equation so what to do is the total displacement basically we write as a summation of individual modes itself and these are the modes so first mode second mode third mode fourth mode fifth mode sixth mode like that we will be having seventh mode eighth mode ninth mode like that so many things will be there so we break down into problems so an is nothing but the contribution actually so how much contribution the first mode has second mode has how much contribution so like this we you know split the problem into several modes and each mode will have its own uh, you know the natural frequency so we write like like this, sin omega x by c cos omega et like that we try to write okay so these are what we call as the mode shapes of it is essentially eigen value eigen vector problem okay? and then the natural frequency so of each mode shape you can write as n plus 1 into pi c by l itself c is the velocity okay which is root of e by rho e is the young modulus and rho is the density of the material actually okay so the philosophy is like this okay so if you know the solution say or if you have recorded say the data so you split into several modes and then if you can identify the natural frequencies if you know the natural frequency you can easily calculate the velocity okay that is c that is anyway related to young's modulus and density you can easily work it with back and then you can get your uh, better properties so, so this is the philosophy okay so in same concept you know, we try to do in all problems also not only for our cantilever beam or multi degree freedom system or anything so this is our data so yes x comma t okay so like we are having the data set the data has been recorded at many places you know and of course it is a function of time so like you know we have instrument you know in uh, chennai we have instrument in trivandrum and if some earthquake has occurred so we have data at all these places so that's what i'm writing as s x comma t itself okay so x is the location it's a vector and t is the time so now what we are trying to do is you know we are trying to extract physical meaning okay so we write this as s of x into e to the power of i omega t so this is anyway the fourier transform you know the angle so if you write like this so we can split so these omegas are what we call as you know eigen frequencies and then of course s of x is nothing but your eigen mode shapes or you know eigen vectors or whatever we say of course this you can do it in a fourier transform also so these are concept so you are having a data set which is a function of time so now we are splitting this uh, you know and then we are trying to look at it, this data as a function of frequency and other uh, details also okay so now uh, so here uh, you know so anyway that is for the small that is a you know the general philosophy now we have to do for a spherical medium that is for a spherical arc actual okay so now the let us see one simple uh, solution you know suppose if you are having a sphere which is made up of fluid only okay it is not a solid it is like any you know, fluid planet itself so everywhere you have a fluid itself and the radius is r not actually and of course its elastic properties because it's a fluid you know so shear modulus will be zero so it will be having a bulk modulus and then you know it will have a some kind of a density itself okay and of course if there are no body forces or anything say so this is the equation of motion okay uh, now uh, all of you remember right what is the equation of motion for a three dimensional solid which you have studied in advanced structural mechanics no. so if i have a three dimensional uh, body say okay it may be a solid or it may be a liquid what is its equation of equilibrium no. you would have studied in uh, continuum mechanics or uh, strength of materials in three dimensions you remember any one of you So in advanced structural mechanics, so what is the equation of a three-dimensional body? So you write in terms of what are the quantities, you know. In advanced structural mechanics, you would have seen that stress cube and others you would have seen, right? What is that equation? So in continuum mechanics or advanced structural mechanics, so what is the equation of motion for a three-dimensional body? We write in terms of stresses, you remember. What is that equation? Do sigma x by do x. Yeah, do sigma x x by do x plus do sigma x y by do y plus do sigma x z by do z is a plus. Of course, you have a body force. On right hand side, you will be having rho into do square u by do t square. Okay. So like that, you will be having three such equations. So if you take that equations and if it is a fluid, say what happens to sigma x y sigma x z sigma you know y z? What happens to the shear stresses if it is a fluid? Yeah. So if it is a fluid, so no. uh, there will be zero. So you and of course, if it is a fluid, say pressure in all the directions will be same. So sigma x x, sigma y y, sigma z z, all of them will be simply p only. Okay. So if you write so in those equations, 
if you substitute say tau ij is a p delta ij that means you know your 3 by 3 stress matrix will have only diagonal terms and all of them are same so, and you substitute this in your equations of equilibrium so what you have studied in your advanced structural mechanics are the fundamental equations say. you will get this rho u double dot is minus a del times say, you know the p okay and of course the hooks law say, that is your constitutive relations you know the stress strain relations you say so there also you remove the shear stresses and wherever you have normal stresses you replace with the p p p p kind of thing so these are your uh, you know, constitutive equations and then you integrate both of them if you combine you know you will get uh, you see the c square del square p by you see this uh, do square p by do t square itself you know so this is a equation of uh, equilibrium for a fluid sphere okay so with the fluid sphere with radius r not so so this is a equation of equilibrium and of course c square is root of k by rho k is the bulk modulus and rho is the density so now this laplacian operator so whatever we have del square you know so this operator and of course this is a spherical and of course we are trying to solve this in a spherical coordinate system because it's a fluid sphere right so i hope all of you are familiar with the spherical coordinates generally cartesian means we write as xyz but in spherical so we have r delta as well as a phi co latitude co longitude you know all those azimuth are you know so that is how we try to do r delta and then phi itself okay so this is our coordinate system so your laplacian operator so that is a del square you know whatever we have written here so the del square p so this laplacian operator in cartesian is do square by do x square plus do square by do y square plus do square by do z square but if it is in spherical coordinate systems it looks little bit uh, you know a big expression because it is not x y z you have r then delta then you have phi itself so three things will be there so this is our laplacian operator so this we have to solve to get our uh, solution you know or if you want to find it so you have to get you have to solve this uh, laplacian operator so this is our equation so c square del square p is equal to do square p by do t square and it is same as the one dimensional wave equation only so one dimension it is c square do square over do x square is do square over do t square but now the same thing we are writing in spherical coordinate system in all the uh, you know the directions itself so this is our uh, laplacian operator so this is a partial differential equation is there so how do you solve the partial differential equation generally now what method we use yeah partial differential equation so what is the method we use in our uh, general this one so how do you solve the pde So this PDA say now how do you solve the partial differential equation? You can see here what is the method we separating use? Separating the variable. Uh, separation of variables, excellent. Okay, so now you are having R, then delta, then phi. The derivatives are there. So you write solution like this: P is equal to R of R. This is phi of delta. This one phi of phi t of t. So you write like this. Okay. So if you substitute this R of R, this in this expression say, so you and of course T is anyway e to the power of i omega t, okay, like a Fourier transform we do. So then automatically what happens is you know, so we will get uh, you see these type of equations we will get, okay, that is a sine square delta d by dr r square, and then we have to do some algebra. So if you separate all those terms say, so all the derivatives with respect to r, then delta, then we have omega square r square is sine square delta is one by phi d square phi by d phi square. Okay, so if you see on the left hand side, so you are having derivatives with respect to r, then delta. On the right hand side, you are having derivatives with respect to phi itself. Okay, so right hand side you are having a functions which are varying with phi, and left hand side you are having a functions which are varying with r as well as the delta set. So now the only way you know both of them, left hand side, right hand side is equal is you know. Both of them has to be equal to a constant to some uh, k itself. So if you write that constant say, so what happens? One by phi d square phi by d phi square is equal to k itself. So the solution of that equation means phi is equal to e to the power of i m uh, phi itself. And of course, m can go from zero plus r minus one plus r minus two plus r minus three itself. So you substitute this phi is equal to e to the power of i m phi, and then you write on the left hand side also. You will get you know you can separate r terms on one side. And then delta terms is on uh, completely on the uh, other side itself. So phi is gone from this expression. Now we are having two equations. Left hand side is r, right hand side is uh, delta itself. So this also should be equal to a constant, and you can solve this uh, PDS also. Okay. So this is how we do two separate equations: one for r, 
other one for delta. The reason is, uh, you know, and of course, k is a constant because we are having terms which vary with r, terms which vary with the delta, say. So they have to be equal. You know, the only way is they should be equal to a constant itself. So that constant we are writing as a capital K itself. So these two equations we get here. So, you know, you can see, so the uh, original equation was a partial differential equation by using this, uh, you know, separation of variables. So this a PD has been converted into an ordinary differential equation, you know. So this is ordinary differential equation. D square phi by D phi square is one equation is equal to some constant. And then we have D by DR, you know, and D by D delta. Initially it was a do, now it has become D itself because of the separation of variables itself. Now here, uh, you know, the solutions are very interesting here because M is there, you know, M can be zero or it can be this one. So M is equal to zero means you will have separate special, uh, you know, the solutions will be there. So when M is zero say, so R term, nothing will change to the R, uh, this equation. But when you see this delta say, when M is equal to zero, so you will have only K. So this term only will be there. And finally, say, so the equation becomes D by D delta, sine delta, D phi by D delta. And this side, it will be having minus K times this is phi sine of delta itself. And if you write x is equal to cos delta s, so this equation can be written as in this format. 1 minus x square, d square phi by dx square minus 2x plus k phi is equal to 0. Uh, can anybody tell me what is this equation? Uh, so this equation has a very special name in uh, you know, the mathematics. What is this, uh, this equation? Is, what is this equation? So in your partial differential equation class, you, know, you would have studied this special equation, you know. Yeah. The solution of this equation, uh, you know, what do you call these type of equations? It can be represented in terms of some special functions. Can you identify? Now, what type of equation it is, you know, this equation is a special name, you know, in the mathematics. Uh, so what is this equation, you know, 1 minus x square, d square, phi by dx square, 2x, you know, uh, what is this equation corresponds to? Uh, so you can read here, what is this equation? Uh, legendary. Uh, it is a basically a legendary equation. You know, okay. And of course, the solution of this equation, you can write in terms of legendary polynomials. So, okay. So this is a theta, that is the one which you are solving. You can write as a PL of X and this is how the legendary polynomials, you know, looks like this. So, uh, you know, so for phi say, it is basically a simple harmonic. Phi and uh, T, it is simply e to the power of I omega T, e to the power of I M phi. Ordinary simple harmonic equations only we will get. But when it comes to delta, you will get the legendary, you know, the polynomials itself, okay? So the solution can be written in terms of legendary polynomials, PL of X itself. And it is, uh, you know, L is the order of the polynomial. It looks like this, you know, if L is 0, so it is 1, P1 is X, P2 is a 3X square minus 1. Like that, you will have a legendary polynomials and you can write in this type of uh, format also, okay? So these are the legendary functions. And if you plot these legendary functions, so they look something, uh, you know, like this actually, okay? So when R is equal to 1, say, so this is a original polynomial. When R is equal to 1, P naught X is 1 itself, okay? And P1X is X. So if you try to plot on this uh, order, so you will see variety, you know, so this uh, dot, this uh, dot, this line say, uh, you know, the, uh, this line is basically R1 minus P2, then P3, then P4, then P5 say, they look something like this. So what is that you can observe here? Yeah. So when R is equal to one is the original sphere basically. So now what is happening as order of the polynomial is increasing say, okay, now this is, a, here up to P5, then P5, P7, P10, P14, say. How these uh, oscillations are looking like? So what is your observation? More number of oscillations. Uh, more number of oscillations. That means more number of nodes, actually. Okay. So these are the points, you say, where the displacement or where the quantity is zero. We call them as nodes, okay, in the mode shape generally. So this also increases and then, you know, the oscillations also, you know, the amplitudes are also very high. So these are the legendary polynomials comes into picture. Now when M is not equal to zero, say, then the equation, you know, because M is not equal to zero. So obviously what happens is, you know, this M, this, this now you have to solve it in a slightly different, uh, you know, the fashion itself. So this is also once again, legendary equation only, but some slightly modifications are there. 
So you will have an equation like this: one minus x square dm plus two by dx m plus two pl. Uh, you know this one. Of course, when m is equal to zero, it boils down to the previous equation itself. Then you know the solution. Say you can write it in terms of uh, you know the fully the uh, one you know the, it is like a combination because m is not equal to zero. So what happens is e to the power of i m phi also will be there, and you will have a legendary polynomial also. And of course, it depends on m also. P l m be right cos delta. So you will have a special uh, function itself. So this function is what we call a surface harmonic section. Okay, so that is what we denote this as y l m delta comma phi, and so this is the expression you know which we write uh, you know for the surface uh, you know the harmonics when m is not equal to zero. That is a generalized case you know, which we are showing here, and of course this is basically the eigen vector or you know it has all kinds of properties also, and you know like cos and sine so they are also orthogonal to each other. Similarly, the surface harmonics. So they are also orthogonal to each other. And if you try to do this one, y l m del phi, uh, you know, multiplied by y uh, l dash m dash is same. If m and m dash, l and l dash are not equal to zero, then automatically, you know, it will be orthogonal. That means your product will be equal to zero itself. And they are, you know, uh, orthogonal on the when you do the integration of the sphere itself. So this is surface harmonics are same as you know you are a cos k x k y whatever we do in Cartesian and if it is a you know, cylindrical coordinate system so Bessel functions will come so all of them you know it has all kinds of properties itself okay orthogonality everything will be there you know they will be all these kind of the things itself okay so this is how the equation is okay so finally so del square p is our equation for a fluid uh, sphere. So finally, if you write so phi delta phi of phi y l m l, this is our uh, you know the basic uh, equation itself. So now phi is known, and then the delta is known, phi is known to you, and then we have to solve this equation with respect to r. See, we have already had the uh, P D was converted to uh, three O D E's. So this was our original P D. So it has been converted to three one P D one O D E's with respect to phi e to the power of i m phi came. Then we had two equations, one for r, one for delta. So delta also we have done. Now we have to look at this equation that is called the equation with the r what type of solutions we get okay so here also so this is also a special uh, equation here okay so this is more or less close to you know like a hankel functions or you know the bessel functions or whatever so you can use those type of this, this equation correspond to that type of functions so we can write the solution in terms of bessel or that hankel uh, you know the transformed and hankel functions itself so this is how the you know the spherical Hankel functions I say that is how the solutions have to be written with respect to R itself. So with respect to delta and phi, we have spherical harmonics or that surface harmonics, and then with respect to R, so we have as Hankel functions, you know, more or less that. So that is unit by this spherical Bessel function only. You can write like this. So here also we have when L is equal to zero, say. So then we have a simple sinusoidal. It's uh, easy. But when L is equal to one, L is equal to two, you will have this type of Bessel that spherical, you know, the Hankel functions comes into picture itself. Okay. And finally, say so when N is equal to zero, other uh, sorry, L is equal to zero, you know. So when L is equal to zero, and then the boundary condition is uh, you know the surface say. So the surface of the sphere, uh, the force is zero, it means there is a stress-free kind of a surface. So if you use the boundary condition, it is something like you know, you are uh, you know, the how to find out the natural frequency, you know. Are the buckling mode shapes say you would have uh, done in our uh, stability or dynamics also you finally you write the equations and then you write the free boundary condition and you get in terms of a matrix and then you solve so here also after getting all the things then we apply the boundary condition say if the stresses are zero at the surface or pressure is zero at the surface or whatever you will get so for l is equal to zero say okay so when l is equal to zero so this is our solution basically. So now what happens is sine omega r naught by c is equal to zero. We get so finally solving this one, so you will get the natural frequency of your fluid sphere uh, for l is equal to zero. So that is n plus one into pi c by r naught. So c is a velocity root of that uh, you know bulk modulus or whatever we said previously. So n is equal to zero gives the first fundamental mode. And when n is more than or equal to one, say it constitutes the overtone. That is the node points are the higher modes basically. So like so motions with L is equal to zero are basically you know a pure radial modes we say and of course u delta u phi is zero one can show also so if you take uh, r naught as six thousand kilometers so like our radius of our r and then c that is a uh, velocity is a five kilometer per second say so the first natural time period you know in seconds you know you substitute here n is equal to zero you substitute all those things so what is the first fundamental mode so can you see what is the first fundamental mode of a fluid sphere? 
with the 6000 km radius and the velocity is 5 km per second. So, what is its uh, first natural frequency? Yeah. Now, can you read here what is the first uh, natural time period basically? Yeah. 2000 hours. Yeah, 2400 seconds. So, if you write in terms of minutes, you say divide by 60, 40 minutes. So, 40 minutes is the first time period of a fluid sphere uh, which has radius 6000 and 5 kilometers. This one now, when L is equal to 2, say it will have in several natural frequencies. But the problem is when L is equal to 2, uh, you have to solve the you have to find out zeros of this equation. Okay, it is not that straightforward. When L is equal to 0, it is very simple sine omega r naught by c is equal to 0. But when L is equal to 2, you will have complicated term because of that uh, Hankel functions and others. So you have to do it in a numerical uh, sense itself, okay, where to that comes 0 or whatever. So the first zero is say of this spherical Hankel function comes 1.8, N is equal to 0, L is equal to 2. It turns out to be 22 minutes basically, okay. So usually you can find out all the natural frequencies, you know, of the natural time period of your fluid sphere. So these are on the eigen functions also we can plot. Okay, that is a mode shape. You know the natural time, natural frequency or the natural time period. You can also plot the mode shape also. So like this is the first fundamental mode. N is equal to zero. Okay, so it looks like this. Then n is equal to one. Then n is equal to two. Say the mode looks like this. And now if you plot n r two, okay, that n r two means uh, you know it comes like this is our expression. Okay, so this uh, mode shape if you try to plot it. So for n is equal to zero, you get like this. Then you know, so this is how the mode shapes you know looks like actually. Of course, here the mode shapes are not uh, that straightforward because your mode shape depends on L, M, and then uh, N itself. You know, so these uh, you will have different different uh, mode shapes for a fluid sphere. Okay. And now here uh, you can easily see. Suppose you, by looking at these mode shapes, say, can you tell me you know? If I want to find out, uh, you know, what is uh, inside, like what uh, uh, that uh, type of the core, well, you know, the core are essentially say, what type of material is at the core? So which mode shape will tell me? Yeah. So which mode shape will tell me? Uh, you know, the metal properties in the core are at the center of the cube. Yeah. Which mode shape I have to observe? So I am showing left side figure, right side figure. Okay. So now if I want to find out at the inner of the sphere, say, what type of material is there, just approximately. So which mode shape will tell me, which mode shape is there, will tell me that information. The left one or the right one. Now, which one will tell me. So what is the right side, what is happening this inquiry, what is it R is equal to zero, what is the value of the mode. So what is the displacement here at r is equal to 0 for n r 2? 0. Uh, 0. So what does it tell you whether this mode, uh, you know, the, the center of your cube is getting oscillated or you know, center of the cube is vibrating, this mode shape? No, sir. No. Now this one, if you see on this side, so what is happening here at r is equal to 0, so what is the value? So one. Uh, it is one. So what does it mean? So if you want, so this mode, say, looking at this mode, you can easily identify which mode will give you, you know, uh, so that portion is getting, uh, you know, oscillation or vibration is happening. You can easily identify actually. Okay. So these are how the mode shapes looks like for a fluid sphere. Okay. And then, uh, you know, you can easily find out, of course, uh, for uh, these mode shapes, so they are all orthogonal. And here, one more important thing, what happens in uh, spherical thing is a degeneracy, we say. Degeneracy means you know uh, two three normal modes. So we'll have the same frequency also. That also ha happens because it's a sphere, right? Uh, minus two pi to two pi, you know zero to two pi. Once again, uh, you know it happens itself. So the degeneracy also it happens. So you can easily prove the orthogonality of the mode shapes on a sphere, the surface mm -hmm. harmonics and other things also. And the degeneracy we say like you see l greater than zero, n greater than zero. There are basically two l plus one free oscillations. Sharing the same eigenfrequency n omega l and same radial eigen functions itself. So you will have uh, you know same frequency, same this one. You know, several combinations are possible. So this is what we call as you know, degeneracy itself. So this happens because of a sphere. Okay, because zero to two pi, 
two five two, you know, if you four five say the same as the same thing, you will get you know two times or this one. So the degeneracy also happens, you know, when you work with the sphere, uh, you know, the normal groups. Okay. And now this is for uh, you know a fluid sphere. But if you want to understand terrestrial planets, you say this that may be useful for studying, you know, the Jupiter moons, which is completely fluid or whatever, or icy planets or whatever. But when you are looking for terrestrial planets, which is a solid. so one should understand you know the natural frequencies or how to solve for a solid sphere okay so this uh, so this was initially you know so it was done by professor lamb you know, horas lamb so he published his paper i think in royal society you know where he has done the free oscillations of a solid sphere you know he published in 1892 the analytical derivations he has done okay so and finally the all the equations are same Like your stress equations of equilibrium, so those sigma x x by do x, the same equation he wrote in uh, spherical coordinates, and then there also he got the same, you know, separation of variables and all those things he has done. But now here, when fluid say you have only one surface harmonic only because things are all, you know, only one pressure is there, and everywhere the pressure is same. So you had only y l m, you know, only one uh, thing like that. But when it is a sphere say because you have shear stresses. All other things, so you will have surface vector harmonics. We say, okay, that is R, yes, and then T. So these are all vectors you will have be having here. So you, be, you know, these are uh, spherical harmonics can be derived in in terms of these uh, numbers itself. And then in the two the sphere say, what one does is uh, you know one more important thing is so this is a stress cube which you all of you would have uh, you know studied in your advanced structural mechanics. Okay, so if you see uh, any plane, say how many stresses are there? Now, if you see any plane, how many stresses are there? The components. Three components. Yeah, three components are there. Now here, one uh, interesting thing, what one do is, this is a three D problem. Say, you can split this a three D problem into two two D problems. Actually, one problem is like if you see this plane, say sigma y y and tau y z is one. Okay, so you take this as a, you know P S V problem or this problem. And then tau y x is what we call as a shear horizontal only. So this is three D problems. We split it into two two D problems. One is a sigma y y tau y z. Other one is a tau y x x. The uh, you know the philosophy is like this. Okay, I showed you this uh, accelerogram. This you know that uh, data also initially. Yeah. So now what is happening here when you look at this uh, data set? See vertical component, longitudinal component, transverse component are there. So these are three dimensions. But what is that here? You can observe here. So in vertical and longitudinal, sir, what type of waves are there? Rally. Ah, uh, only you are having rally waves only. But in transverse component, do you have uh, rally waves? Sir? Only low. Ah, uh, only. Low. So what does it tells you? So this is a three D. The data is a three dimension, sir. So but what does it tells you? So if you rotate the instruments here, one is vertical, longitudinal, and then transverse. Okay. So what it tells you, this three-dimensional problem can be split into. Yeah. So if you want to study Rayleigh waves, say, do you require transverse component? Yeah. No need. Yeah, no need. Suppose if you want to study love waves, say, do you require a vertical component or a longitudinal component? So if you want, if I have longitudinal data or vertical data, say, can you? Uh, if I want to study love waves, say, whether these these two components are required? No, sir. Uh, no, so what does it tells you? Although the problem is a three-dimensional problem, what it says is essentially you are having two two-dimensional problems. One is vertical longitudinal can be combined in one group actually, and then transverse can be combined into separate group. But only trick is you have to rotate the instrument, you know, along vertical longitudinal and transverse directions, so, which I told you in the previous classes also. So mathematically also one can show this is a two-D problem, sir. This three-D problem. We can split into two two-dimensional problems. We say, okay, so that is say, you know, sigma y y tau y z as one. That is Rayleigh wave this thing, and tau y x say that is a shear horizontal. So that is your love waves kind of thing. So this we call in seismology. So this is a planetary thing. We call the sigma y y tau y z as a P S V problem. That is a P wave and shear vertical we say, and tau y x is shear horizontal itself. So this is how you know we try to do. You see, 
this type of two 2d problems so mathematically also one can uh, show this is valid and then you know you can uh, you know so this is so uh, spherical this one so what we call this as psv problem so they call this spheroidal motion okay so this is what they call the spheroidal motion other one is a toroidal motion so spheroidal means it is a psv that is sigma y by tau z is a spheroidal and tau y x is, uh, is basically a toroidal mode itself okay so this is how you know with they try to understand so the same data sir so if you look at this uh, data whichever uh, which i showed you previously yeah. so now uh, so spheroidal means which are the components here uh, which is spheroidal which is a toroidal here uh, spheroidal means which components have to take yeah. optical and long yeah. vertical longitudinal spheroidal that is what psv sigma y by sigma y x or something now toroidal means you know, the transverse. So toroidal modes are related to love waves and other things, but your spheroidal set is related to your uh, rally waves. So that is how you know they try to do. So the data also shows mathematically also you know one can show that you can split it into two separate uh, problems itself. Okay. So this also one can do. Okay. So this is what they do, and then you know one can mathematically show all these things also. Anyway, uh, no need to worry about the mathematical details. At least you should know these terms actually. Like spheroidal mode toroidal mode itself okay so you solve this problem and then you know so this is a solid sphere it is not a fluid sphere so solid means you have shear stresses also you have to solve all those things itself you know so these are how, how you know the solution we write like this okay so the three components will be there, the displacement r s and then t these are the vectors okay so these are and of course r and s they stand for uh, spheroidal mode and t is the uh, toroidal mode okay so if you are having displacement in longitudinal transverse and vertical say longitudinal and vertical will be spheroidal transverse will be toroidal but if you rotate the coordinate systems in xyz coordinate systems then you know the spheroidal and toroidal they get combined actually okay so this is how you know we try to calculate so we split the problem we rotate the problem into longitudinal transverse and uh, you know this uh, this vertical direction we solve the solution and then you know we can write it in other directions also as a combination okay so this is what they do so the two things so you can split into two problems so one is VUSR. So this is your spheroidal mode and this is your toroidal mode. Okay. So two ordinary differential equations, you know, we have here and then you solve this separate, separate and then you work it out the solution itself. Okay. So this is what they say. So two type of modes. One is a spheroidal mode with horizontal wave functions and radial wave functions. So the toroidal is, you know, denoted by this uh, TL itself and the stresses also like, you know, sigma YX or whatever, you know, the tangential stresses. So this T is your tangential thing. S and R is the stresses in uh, horizontal and uh, you know the longitudinal direction. So the everything splits into two separate problems. So the whole complete 3D is split into two two-dimensional uh, problems itself. Okay. So now to find out the normal mode, say so you have to solve these equations. Okay. And of course, the EA solution is the boundary condition is surface of the stress is free. You solve this this eigenvalue, eigenvector problem, and you can get the uh, natural frequencies of spheroidal mode as well as the uh, toroidal uh, mode itself, okay? So we denote this as N omega L kind of uh, things itself. And of course, if you want to find out the, if there is any earthquake occurring, say, okay? So generally earthquake is something like a force or a discontinuity, which you can write in terms of stresses. We use a double couple and other things also. Uh, no need to worry about this one. So using the strains and then the stresses, you know, you can easily compute the final displacement, okay? So what we try to do is, for earth, you know, we compute all the uh, mode shapes, eigenvalues, eigenvectors, the mode shapes and others. So if there is a forced vibration problem, so you use the Duhamel's integral, what you have studied in dynamics. So same concept we use uh, here also in, to compute the response of the, uh, you know, the earth for a point source or for some uh, earthquake uh, source itself, okay? And now this is how the data looks. So now if you, if you look at the data so of any earthquake, I showed you previously Bolivia and other earthquakes also, but of course you have to record for 60 hours or 70 hours, you know, because the earthquake force would have died down. Everything will be free oscillation itself. And if you try to plot it in the frequency domain, and then you, know, you can easily identify all these peaks, say, they correspond to these uh, natural frequencies. That is this N omega, you know, the L or whatever we wrote, so these natural frequencies you can easily identify for the mode shapes also from this uh, spectrum itself. Okay. Now another thing, what right now people do is you know if you are having lot of data set and data set the data has been recorded at you know Madras, Trivandrum, at several places of the globe. So you correct this data 
and then you add all the data so such that you know the modes will get amplified and then you do the fourier transform you can easily identify these modes you know s18 s19 you know all the mode shapes can be identified so these are variety of uh, you know the techniques are there to get this uh, modes and then you know their corresponding uh, natural frequencies now this is for a you know the sphere so i showed you fluid sphere what happens solid sphere what happens but now in earth you know the, for a planet say the most important thing for a planet is you know the gravity okay the gravity affects this uh, natural frequencies also now gravity what is it? so gravity will affect what uh, which one which will affect uh, spheroidal or toroidal gravity is what type of force it is uh, so you can you read here gravity means you know what is a gravity what type of stress is gravity basically So gravity means gravitational forces. Say you can add uh, whether it's a shear stress or it's a normal stress. Normal. Uh, it is basically a normal stress only. Okay. So what does so now whether it affects uh, this toroidal mode? Say? See the toroidal modes are what type of things? Toroidal is essentially. No. So toroidal is related to tau y, y x basically, okay, shear stress. So if you are having a gravitational forces, say, they will affect what type of modes? Uh, toroidal modes, it doesn't affect, but you know, the PS, which is spheroidal modes only will get affected by the gravity, okay? So here, when there is a gravity, say, so these equations you have to solve, and then there are some, you know, people have calculated also. So Lamb, you know, he did it for a elastic sphere, he ignored gravity, okay? And he said that, you know, the, the he has found out the natural, time periods also and he has calculated so if you're having a uh, same size and mass of work and the metal property he took it as steel metal property rigidity of the steel so the period says zero s2 is about 65 minutes actually and if you include gravity say the 65 minutes will be reduced to 55 minutes basically so that means you know the gravity say it plays a major role in uh, you know the natural frequencies itself so but it affects only the spheroidal model it will not affect any you know the toroidal uh, so the modes itself okay so the equations have to be once again solved only for spheroidal case only so the famous equation to solve for gravity say that hydrostatic uh, pressure we say that is that poisson's uh, you know the equation del square v naught is equal to you know 4 pi gamma rho naught where v naught is your gravitational potential so these are very famous uh, gravity equations are there you we will not go into the details so using these equations so we can find out corrections also now we are having a solid sphere then you include gravity also then you know you will get some uh, correction things also. So the same equation, this is the equation of equilibrium. Okay. So for gravitational solid, gravity is also included. So the first three terms is same. So wherever G naught is coming, so this is our uh, effect of gravity. The remaining terms are all continuum mechanics only, that wave equation so on. But these three uh, gravity comes into this uh, picture itself. So you solve this equation, same spherical harmonics and others. But here you will say get some extra terms, okay, to include this gravitational potential also. This also will have a spherical harmonics kind of a thing. And then the stresses also. So you'll have some extra terms. And then, you know, we used to have you do you by dr, dr by dr, dv by dr, ds by dr. But you will be having k and g also. So these uh, matrices which we have written previously, so four by four matrix is there. We had for a spheroidal and toroidal, we have two by two matrix. But since we are having gravity, say, so these are four becomes, you know, uh, six basically so two things comes for uh, gravity okay so six by six matrices we get and you solve all those uh, things you know so automatically you will get you see the you know the angular the natural frequency and others so these are the plots basically okay for spheroidal modes so angular order number and here's a omega okay so n is equal to zero n is equal to one n is equal to two this is how you know the dispersion curves or the natural frequencies uh, the theoretical values they look like in this uh, map actually and now here you can easily identify, you know, the inner core and other things also. So you can see, so this region say, that is in this region, you will see PKIKP. Uh, what is a PKIKP, PKP? Yeah. So we told in the last class, no, what is a PKIKP? You remember? Yeah. PKIKP, PKJKP, we discussed in the last class. What does that IKJ, what does it indicate?
See P K I K P. What does P K I K P tells us? P K I K P is here. This wave has passed through mantle, yeah, mantle, and it has also passed through the. See P wave was here. P wave, P wave, P wave, and it has passed through the inner core as well as the mantle. So you can easily identify all these things theoretically also. Okay. So this is how you know we extract all the details basically. So we extract, you know, these uh, things. Okay. So easily you can identify. So from this type of graphs, design, you can identify, you know, the metal properties, and you can get all these uh, details itself. Okay. This is for the spiral modes, and you can easily identify. The first one, these are rally waves actually. N is equal to zero. Okay. So these are rally waves, same graph only, and these are like you know, stonely modes, stonely modes. We say that means these waves are coming from core mantle boundary inner core boundary so like you i told you right pk ikp so these are all the you know the boundary section so in this region say you will see waves which have traveled through the inner core mantle and other things also pkp means you know only maybe mantle itself then the p wave then sks scs sv you can identify all the natural frequencies and then uh, you know you can get all the details actually and you can easily Find out the internal structure of a planet itself. Those stonely modes are there. Then these are the toroidal modes actually. So this also you can plot it, and then you can get all this uh, information also. Okay. So anyway, so I will stop here. Uh, we will continue in the next class. I have some uh, meeting is uh, there for you today. Okay. So if you have any doubts, you can ask.